Probably a good time to leave. <laughs> How you doing? You all right? Okay. Yeah, you want to do it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So. Um, Smart. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Everybody rise as we're going to return the Torah scrolls to the ark. Back in the ark, then. I got it. No. Yeah, yeah. It's high in the morning. So the um, story is told that uh, there were wolves decimating the farmer's sheep, because that's what wolves do. And so in desperation, the authorities in the county raised the bounty on them to $25,000 each. So there were two brothers who decided, wow, this is a great opportunity, $25,000 each for each wolf that were able to capture or kill. And so they decided they could really use the money and they headed out to the wide open spaces to shoot some wolves and capitalize on this fantastic financial opportunity. They had just fallen asleep out under the stars when a <clears throat> kind of growling noise woke one of them. There in the reflection of the dimming campfire, he saw the yellow eyes of 25 wolves shining back at him. 25 rows of razor-sharp teeth gleaming in the light. Every single one of them growling and slowly walking one step at a time toward those two brothers, completely surrounding them on all sides, getting closer and closer and closer. He looked around at this terrifying nightmare that was about to befall them, all alone out in the wilderness, surrounded by those 25 angry, growling, razor-sharp teeth. No, I can't say that. Razor-sharp wolves. And in a panic, he shook his brother awake and then whispered hoarsely, Wake up! Wake up! We're rich! <laughs> okay, I love that story because it reminds me of one of the most important lessons that I have learned from my 37 years as a rabbi, which isn't about don't go hunting wolves, but is attitude is everything. Attitude is everything. Hard as you try to control your life to make the best decisions that you can, to be the best person that you can, the reality is that life has a mind of its own. And most of the time you obviously can't really choose the circumstances of your life. Things just happen. Good things, bad things. No one makes it through life without pain and loss, without sorrow and disappointment. And most of the time, we don't even get a vote. Life just happens. But one truth I have learned over and over again from my own life, and obviously from the privilege of being intimately involved in literally thousands of your lives over all these years, 
is that it isn't really the ups and downs or the traumas or successes, it isn't the circumstances of our lives at all that really matter. It is always the one thing that every one of us does bring to each of these moments in our lives that really does matter, and that's our own attitude. It's our attitude that always matters most. It's like that little boy who kept bragging to his father about how he really wanted to play baseball. He really wanted to play baseball, Dad, because he knew what a great hitter he was going to be. So finally, after hearing this day after day, his dad said, okay, show me. So the kid gets his softball in one hand and his bat in the other hand, and they go out to the backyard. The father stood to the side watching, just like that, stood to the side watching, and uh, as the kid tossed the ball up into the air and then swung the bat, strike one, said his father as the ball hit the ground untouched. The kid wasn't phased at all. Picked up the ball, tossed it up in the air, and swung at it even harder. Strike two, said his father a little more quietly as the kid totally missed the ball again. Undeterred, the young man smiled broadly and, don't worry, Dad, tossed the ball up in the air for the third time, and this time he swung even faster and harder. Strike three, said his father, sadly. So the little boy looked up at his dad, totally unfazed, with a huge grin on his face, and he proudly declared, boy, am I a great pitcher. That's my kind of boy. That's my kind of attitude. That's the person I want to work with. That's the person I want to live with. That's the person I do live with, actually. That's the person who can always see the possibilities in every challenge. You know that each one of us in our eyes have both dark and light in our eyes. But we actually only see the world by looking right through the dark part into the light that's all around us. So this is my last high holiday season. I would do that too, actually. No, this is my last high holiday season as your senior rabbi. As most of you know, I am uh, scheduled to retire from that position as of this coming June. And the fabulous, articulate, brilliant, and talented Rabbi Amy Bernstein will become the new senior rabbi and spiritual leader of KI as I become the emeritus. And what emeritus means exactly, we will discover together throughout the coming years. Of course, I know that some of you think I already retired. I kept getting people going, what are you doing now? <laughs> this is what I'm still doing now. But I assure you, it actually isn't until next June. For there's still much for me to do at KI. Until then, frankly, including you know, the need to fund a strong endowment to ensure the financial stability of KI into the future. And in fact, uh, I recently signed a, what amounts to a lifetime contract with KI to continue to serve the congregation in a variety of meaningful ways in my capacity as emeritus rabbi for the rest of my life. So I'm still going to have an office here and still be part of the life of the community going forward. And Didi and I recently moved just down the street about two and a half blocks away, even closer to the synagogue, so I'm really not going anywhere and you're basically stuck with us forever. But change is real nonetheless, and transitions are challenging, and so naturally I've been looking back at the last 28 years that I have been privileged to serve here as a rabbi, and really the th last 37 years that I've been a rabbi, uh, since I was first ordained in New York in 1976. And I've been thinking about, well, the thousands of people that I've had the privilege of interacting with, and so many people that have let me into the most sensitive and powerful moments of their lives. Thousands of wedding couples that I've joined together and uh, bar and bat mitzvah boys and girls. I've taught and the hundreds of men and women whom I have had the privilege of converting to Judaism, welcoming into the Jewish family over the years. And of course the tragedies as well, the young and old that I have buried in Friday night and Saturday morning and holiday services and babies that I've named and individuals who have shared their tragedies and their fears and their laughter and their tears with me over these years. 
And so I wanted to share with you in the next few minutes just um, quickly six of the most important lessons that I think I've learned in all those years. And the first one I already shared, which is attitude is everything. And that's why it's always true that the happiest people don't necessarily have the best of everything. They just make the best of everything. Like our longtime congregant, Bob Schiller, many of you know, is now 95 and uh, was a wonderful comedy writer. I love Lucy and Maud and all in the family and lots of other things. You know, every time you see Bob, every time you greet him, and every time you say, Bob, how you doing? He always answers, perfect, but improving. <laughs> That's an attitude. So, um, as I was writing this sermon and thinking about this, I realized what a difficult task it is. It's hard enough just to explain to someone actually what a, what a rabbi does and what a rabbi is let alone what an emeritus rabbi might be. Uh, you know, it reminds me of a story that I've told in the past, one of my favorite rabbi moments, which was asking a, a young religious school class if they know what the definition of a rabbi is, and a little girl raises her hand and says, yes, a rabbi is someone who talks to God through a microphone. <laughs> and uh, frankly, I remember how difficult it was to explain to Gable when uh, she was little, what I did all day long as a rabbi, even though she was you know, two and a half when we first met, and four when I became her Abba, and she's uh, literally grown up as a rabbi's daughter her whole life, poor kid. Um, but I once heard Lee Iacocca, you know, remember Lee, the former president of Chrysler, talk about his own daughter when she was little, and he said, once when I was vice president of Ford, Leah was asked in kindergarten what her father did, and she answered, I'm not sure. I think he washes cars. <clears throat> well, in Gable's case, she used to turn to me uh, in the morning as I was leaving for the synagogue, and she'd ask, Abba, where are you going? To a wedding, a meeting, or a funeral? <laughs> okay, I admit that's kind of a weird way for a kid to grow up. But it always reminded me of what I think is the second most important lesson that I've learned as a rabbi, that most of the time, the most important thing you can do in life is simply showing up. I know it's uh, Woody Allen who gets credited with the famous line that 90% of success is showing up, but no matter who said it, it's still one of the wisest statements ever said. A family experiences the tragedy of a death, whether a parent, a sibling, or God forbid, a child, as so many of our own families face year after year, and people all around them will turn to me and ask, what can I do, what should I say? I feel so inadequate to comfort them, to help them in any meaningful way. What am I supposed to do? And my answer is always the same. It's just show up. There isn't any magic thing to say. There aren't any right words that are going to make it any better. It's you. Your presence is always the present that matters most. It's just showing up. In the 10th century, uh, a rabbinic work called Tana Debe Eliyahu, God gives advice to all of us and says, my children, what do I seek from you? No more than you, that you love one another and honor one another, and you show your love, you show your honor, your respect and honor for those you love by simply being there, by showing up. That is the best you can do, and the best you can do is enough. Since I sent the announcement a number of months ago to the congregation about <clears throat> my impending retirement, I've been amazed and really humbled by the notes and letters, really sweet notes that people have sent me, sharing rabbi moments from their past with me, something for which they are grateful. Now, as some of you know that I spent a lot of time as a student. I have like an overabundance of degrees. Um, <clears throat> my wife assured me that she would have married me if I only had one PhD, but... Um, you know, I have a couple of BAs and a couple of masters and some PhDs and things and doctors of divinity and I stayed in school a long time. I thought it was safer there than out in the real world. So I just kept getting degrees. But frankly, uh, no matter how many degrees I have, and I was proud of them when I got them, nobody ever sent me a note saying, gee, I really love that you have a master's degree in educational psychology or something. Never meant anything to anybody, what I had on my wall. The only thing that really mattered was that I showed up. That's what made a difference in people's lives. Here's three little short things that I got in the mail. 
thank you for your love and caring for all the times you showed up when I needed you. Supportive, generous, funny, hopefully, sincere and, and simply a minch. Thank you for the generosity of your spirit, the kindness and love you've shown our family. Or from the moment we walked into your office over 14 years ago, I couldn't have asked for a clergy member more caring and sensitive in good times and not so good times. You've always been there for us. Anyway, you get the point. Literally, not one letter of thanks has come in grateful for my degrees. So the third lesson for me is that people don't care how much you know when they know how much you care. People don't care how much you know if they know how much you care. What I've learned from my 37 years as a rabbi is that being smart or knowing a lot about a lot of things doesn't ever matter as much as simply being a mensch. If you want to make a difference in other people's lives, and yes, I ultimately realized that that was the reason I became a rabbi in the first place, to make a difference in other people's lives, first be a mensch and then the rest will follow. And the fourth lesson I learned is reflected in a medieval midrash called Ecclesiastes Rabbah, <clears throat> which teaches a man cannot say to the angel of death, I'm not ready yet. Wait till I make up my accounts. Wait till I make up all my accounts and get ready. There's a story I shared, I think, 23 years ago in a sermon when I announced that uh, for Gable's 10th birthday, that's how I know it was 23 years ago, for Gable's 10th birthday, Dee and I had bought <clears throat> an unusual present. We bought burial plots at Hillside for ourselves. Great present for a 10-year-old. But <clears throat> the point was the death doesn't wait for us to take care of our accounts. It just happens. And preparing for it with our family is one of the greatest gifts that you can give anyone. And I also talked, I remember at the time, about officiating at the funeral the wife of an elderly man who had been married to her for over 60 years. After the funeral, the husband refused to leave the cemetery and the graveside. I remember trying to lead him away and telling him, you know, his friends and family would be waiting back at the house. But he stood rooted to the spot, shaking his head and saying, no, you don't understand, Rabbi, I, I really loved my wife. I said, well, you know, of course you did. I know that. I'm, I'm sure it's difficult to leave, but the service is over and you, you need to go back to your house. And he turned to me and something I never forgot. He said, you don't understand, I loved my wife and once I almost told her. I almost told her. That lesson for me as a rabbi so many years ago, as a husband, as a father and all the other relationships in my life was so powerful stayed with me forever. You don't wait. Don't wait until there's time to say the things that matter because you never know when that time will suddenly be gone. Don't wait till someone's funeral for sure to tell them how much they mean, to share how much they matter, to say the words you want to say and they want to hear. The lesson to remember is always do it now. Do it today. It's the only day. Someone once wrote that if everyone in the world suddenly knew they only had five minutes to live, every phone would be ablaze with the whole world calling each other to say, I love you. I love you. I once saw a Broomhilda cartoon. I don't even know if they still have those. But uh, she just lived through a really miserable day. Everything had gone wrong. And you see her standing, gazing from her window the next morning up at the sky with great frustration, shouting, I demand a replay of yesterday. The truth is, none of us get a replay of yesterday or any day. We only get this day, right here and right now, to make our lives matter. That's what a, a vibrant, fulfilled life is really all about. Living each day as fully as we can. Embracing every day as if it is the only day, ever. So many lessons that I've learned over these past 28 years, not the least of which is a lesson actually taught in the Talmud by a, a rabbi with the name of Ben Zoma. He's quoted as saying, in Hebrew it actually rhymes, Ezuhu chacham halomed mikol adam, which is who is wise, one who learns from everyone. Ben Zoma reminds us of how important 
humility is. Never thinking that you know it all, that you're above learning something of value from someone who was younger or someone who was older or who speaks another language or whose skin is a different color or even appears to be your enemy. No matter how smart I might be, no matter how much I might know about a variety of things, everyone knows more about something than I do. Didi used to tell me every single year as she participated in teaching the 10th grade confirmation classes at KI, that she was sure she learned more from the kids than they ever learned from her. And always loved, they always loved having Didi teach. In fact, every time I'd show up after that, they'd go, where's Didi? Because you learn so much from everyone of every age. And for me, that was always a great lesson in humility. But frankly, the only way any of us continue to learn and grow throughout our lives is by cultivating and embracing a sense of the humble. The Talmud teaches us that the arrogant can never learn. And the best students of any age are always those who are humble enough to say, I know that I don't know. It's like that famous story of the rabbi who wrote a brilliant sermon on humility, but then he never preached it because he was holding on for a really big occasion where he could impress the largest number of people with that sermon. <clears throat> so I constantly remind myself that no matter how many people are in the room, there's probably someone there who's smarter than I am. So let me leave you with one final lesson today that's touched me as a rabbi time and again. I'm sure I've shared this story with you before, but it's the license of being that soon-to-be-retiring rabbi that I'm going to share it again. It's the story of when I was walking down the aisle shopping in Gelson's one day, and I noticed that the only other person in the aisle walking my way with his head down, not making any eye contact with anyone, and of course wearing a baseball hat, because that's what they all do, was one of my favorite actors of all time, Dustin Hoffman. And as uh, Dustin Hoffman kept getting closer and closer to me, I, I hear this whispered conversation taking place behind me between a young girl and her mother. That's okay, mother was saying. You can say something to him. Go ahead, honey, don't be shy. I'm sure he won't mind being recognized. Go on, it'll probably make him smile. So I hear this, so I watch in anticipation as Dustin Hoffman is almost caught up with me where I was standing, and just as he's getting to me, this little girl steps in front and with her arms up in the air says, Rabbi Reuben! <laughs> Dustin Hoffman just keeps walking on by. <laughs> Rabbi Reuben, come on. What could be more precious than that? I learned at that moment what success as a rabbi was really all about. It has nothing to do with how large your congregation is, how beautiful your building might be, how much money or how many benefits are included in your package and contract or how many books or articles you might have published or how often you're quoted in the Jewish Journal or the LA Times. Success is a little girl holding up her hands and saying with delight, Rabbi Rupin. I can hardly think of any sound sweeter than that or any validation of the gift and privilege it is to be a rabbi than that. Success is measured in the realization that you just never know. You never know what words you might have said, what smile or comfort you might have given or support, what music you might have written, what gesture or embrace you might have shared that ultimately meant all the difference in the world to someone. And the miracle is that someone will cherish that moment forever. That is the true measure of success. Being a rabbi is remembering the, that story of the young man who felt overwhelmed by a, a sense of despair when he thought of all the injustice and all the pain and all the cruelty in the world. And so he showed up one more time to a Rosh Hashanah service, to a High Holy Day service, sat in the sanctuary, and he, he prayed, creative power of the universe, where are you? Where are you, God? How can you allow all this injustice, this pain, and this cruelty, and do nothing? Dear, dear God, how can you sit by and watch this world and do nothing? 
And then, of course, he heard that cold mama daka, that quiet inner voice of the sacred whispering in his heart, I didn't do nothing. I made you. I made you. I made you. And that's the most important lesson, not just for me, but for anyone. That's why we're here, to be God's hands, to be God's eyes, to be God's ears, to be the mouth of the sacred, to say the words that must be said to bring more joy and love and holiness into the world. Amen. Thank you. I, lo I love this rabbi. This rabbi, I love this rabbi. And um, when my family joined this congregation, my wife and I were about to have a baby. My, I was so taken in by both Rabbi Rubin and Rabbi Lewert, who embraced my family, my interfaith family, my marriage, our children, named our kids, like nowhere else in the world. I know, it's unbelievable, isn't it? What a great world that we live in that this rabbi, this teacher of Torah, this man who has brought so much love into this part of the world and into so many parts of the world, has taught me how to be so accepting of others and has taught me that I'm good enough and that if I'm standing before you, that means I can help someone else up. I think we all feel the same way. I wanna, I just wanna sing a blessing for him because he also taught me that I can bless people the way he blesses us. I know, isn't it amazing? It's amazing. What a life. Thank God. So I'd like to bless him with this, these words. And then we'll hear maybe some more. Can you sing it for him? I'm sorry, he probably wants to sit down. <laughs> but I don't care. <laughs> And I know the people in all the other rooms in this building feel the same way who are watching this. They all left. <laughs> they didn't leave. Nobody leaves. Nobody really leaves. And all the people who are watching for our Rabbi Reuben, Rabbi Steve. Talk about fulfilling your life's calling for us. Yivarechecha Adonai veyishmerecha May God bless you with good and keep you safe. Yair Adonai May God be with you and be kind to you. 
My daughter's crying here. Can't take you anywhere, honey. <clears throat> Thank you. On page 612. We rise for the Elenu. Please be seated. It is my pleasure as we come close to the conclusion of our service to invite Mike Lurie. It's Michael Lurie, but he just likes Mike, but uh, who are, we are thrilled to have as the president of our congregation to uh, just share some words of greeting with all of you. Uh, I guess it's afternoon now. Good afternoon. I'm Mike Lurie, president of the congregation. Um, our day started this morning at 8.30 at Wadsworth with the early service. I've never been to an early service. It was early. Um, and now I'm at the sanctuary for a sanctuary service. I've never been to the sanctuary. If you haven't been here for a Friday night service, this is what it looks like. There are just people all over the place, and I sure wish it were like that. I do thank you for giving me a few minutes of your time for all these important messages that Stephen wants to hear. And I hate to heck having tried to follow him and mm -hmm. then Julie and her wonderful singing. But that's what they pay me for, so I'm going to do it. I guess we should have um, To those who heard me speak last night at Air Rosh Hashanah, I promise there's only a little itsy bitsy yeah, duplication. Um, all the rest of these Whatever pages is all brand new and challenging and exciting stuff. The message that I want to share with you is. How does it happen that I have spent the last 42 years of my life as an active, engaged member of the congregation? 
I don't know mm-hmm. whether Harry left. I, I always feel like I'm the oldest person in the room unless Harry Sondheim is here because he was president before I joined the temple in 1971. I recall yeah. walking into our former synagogue on this land in 1971 thinking, golly, what a drab, one-story, kind of an ugly building it is. Um, Rabbi Winokur and Cantor Bienenfeld were wonderful as our present uh, clergy um, at creating a warm, caring, and nurturing environment, which is what my message is today. I confess that I joined KI because uh, I moved into the Palisades and this was the neighborhood temple. And I said to somebody, what is this reconstructionist stuff? Because I grew up conservative in Skokie, Illinois. But over the decades, and I love using that word, I apologize, Uh, As I have learned what Reconstructionist Judaism is, I've come to embrace its teachings. It's very warm, it's very caring, it's very open, it's very inclusive. All the things that I think that we want from our congregation and our clergy. I've had the pleasure of serving on the Board of Trustees three times over the last 20 years, once voluntarily. Um, (laughs) And then Rachel Jeffer and Tony Rubin called me a while ago and said, you know, this is about 2000, we'd love you to join the board again. And then just a couple of years ago, Rabbi Rubin and Rabbi Bernstein said to me, we would really love you to be the president of the congregation, which means coming back on the board, and here I am today. But I will tell you, I can't recall a more exciting moment in my life than standing up last night in front of 1,500 people at Wadsworth and saying, what have I gotten myself into? Um, You know, you can volunteer to be honored by opening doors and holding the Torah and things like that. If they ever invite you to honor to be the president for a holiday service, take them up on it. It's a marvelous experience. I blame my mother for all the good things that I've done in my life, and this is serious, I do. She taught me that we should leave the world behind us a little cleaner, a little more organized, uh, a little more orderly than the way we found it. It is why I fix all of the uh, ball marks on greens, Robert. It's just what I do. I have found these same values at KI and in Reconstructionist Judaism, and they're very warm to me. Strong, caring leadership. Strong, caring leadership. A warm, nurturing environment. This place is really cooler than Wadsworth. You you know, you're you're in the right right, uh, temple. And then love of family, including children, and I'll talk about my grandchildren for a moment. So I volunteered to be on the board, and as I mentioned, I was called back to the board. I, I want to thank, among other people, the uh, past presidents, and I, Charlie Kaplan, who is here, Moira Tenzer, Harry Sundheim, and others, who have led by example over the years of this congregation. My message will also be get involved, and we get to that in just a couple of more minutes. But I wanted to read to you the KI mission statement in case you somehow have missed hearing it. Kehelat Israel, a Reconstructionist congregation, is an inclusive, spiritual Jewish community providing a warm, nurturing environment where we pray, learn, educate, perpetuate Torah and Jewish values while serving the greater community. Our present clergy have been there for me and my family for nearly three decades. Uh, Stephen, Cantor Chaim have been here for going on 30 years, Rabbi Bernstein now going on her fourth year, They have graciously presided over family events, including weddings, funerals, brisses, baby namings. My wife, Laura Hazenkamp, and I were the first wedding in February 1998 in our beautiful new sanctuary in our social hall. Our clergy offer leadership and guidance during difficult personal periods, periods of loss or periods of confusion, but they've also helped us to celebrate the joys of my family and our lives. They've made every situation better for us. We all feel that Rabbi Rubin, Rabbi Bernstein, and Cantor Frankel are part of the family. So you can imagine my pride when my two older grandchildren two years ago, my son's son, my daughter's older daughter, asked their parents if they could be B'nai Mitzvah at Papa Mike's temple. I had to tell them it isn't actually my temple, I just work there. Um, Many synagogues would say no, unless the children are in the religious school, but our our, our congregation being inclusive said of course they can. They spent their six months studying with Cantor Frankel and the B'nai Mitzvah staff and were uh, B'nai Mitzvah a year and a half ago. And we already have a date for the two younger granddaughters, B'not Mitzvah, April of 2014. You're all invited. (laughs) And you're all invited. Bring gifts for the rabbi. 
There was no heckling last night, but I like it. <laughs> Thanks, Rabbi. Get used to it. He's yeah. not going to throw me off. Um, all right. As president, I want to thank you all for your involvement in KI, for being here today. But I want to also want to ask your assistance in the coming year in meeting three goals that I have as president. Number one, I want your help to assist in our transition of leadership. Uh, we will be holding small receptions for Rabbi Bernstein so that more of us can meet her. But uh, go to one of those or volunteer to host one. Walk up to her at Eitnonim uh, Shabbat following the Friday services you're going to come to starting next Friday, oh, a week from Friday. Um, introduce yourself so that we can welcome her as our new senior rabbi. Second, please help our congregation with, here's the financial appeal, uh, your financial support. Um, with your dues and your contributions, you enable us to celebrate together, such as today, enable our clergy to be there for all of our members for family events. Some years ago, we created a mitzvah circle for those members who are able to pay more than standard dues. Um, two years ago, we reached out to our congregation and asked our members to make a donation, a commitment to community, if they are able to do so, which is the standard at KI, and contribute whatever amount they're able to. I ask for you to do that. We need these contributions in part because we do not turn away any person or family who asks for membership. A third of our members do not pay our standard dues um, because they're not able to. And so whatever you're able to contribute to our success, we are grateful for. Two years ago, 45% of our members uh, made commitment to community payments. Last year, 60%. I hope that number can go up. Now, my third goal as president is to assist as many members as possible to feel the same inclusion, warmth, and nurturing from our clergy and our congregation as I have for the last 40 years. And the way to do that is to take advantage of the many activities that we offer. I had a, what was it, a 10 minute list last night that I've shared with people, but I have only a couple of, of, of ones that I'll share with you today, starting with, we all get an email weekly from KI, the highlights, the weekly highlights list. Look at it. There are many kinds of activities you can get involved in. One of my favorites is to, as the rabbis say, unwind from your busy week of either work or home by attending a Friday night service. Watch a 13-year-old young adult become an adult being called to the, the Torah, to the Bema, to light candles and say a prayer and share the joy of the Bar Bat Mitzvah family. Volunteer for a tikkun alum activity. Every early May, we have our mega mitzvah day with lots of activities. Or find some volunteer work to do and include your children. They love going to serve food. They, they love getting involved in tikkun alum and charity activities. Um, we formed a social justice committee. I see Laura Diamond here. Um, it's a way for us to take positions on important human rights and civil rights issues. Get involved in that. Get active in their community. We had an Israeli Matters Committee, which has kind of fallen into disrepair, and I intend to reinvigorate it. There is so much going on in the Middle East and for Israel, which I feel is my homeland, internally and externally, and I want to educate our congregation and our community with what's going on there. And then a last activity, very important to me, are the Yisker Memorial Services that we have four times a year. I said last night to connect with our departed loved ones, and I didn't mean talk to them or hear from them. I meant to reach out with our, with our clergy, leading a discussion and feeling the warmth of the generations. We have a wonderful congregation full of interesting people. Get to know them, get to know them. Uh, I look forward to the challenges facing our congregation. This